Hey everybody, I'm Ben Gramico from InterNACHI. That's the International Association of Certified Home Inspectors. We do crazy things like uh, free online webinars where we get uh, experts in the industry to share some of their knowledge to us home inspectors so that we can do a better job. And when we're out there, we want to do really two things. We want to get back home, so we want to protect ourselves, but also the things that we do on site, like inspect buildings and homes, we want to protect other people as well. So I hooked up with my buddy, Tommy Davis. He's a master electrician and he is focused on protecting other people in a particular way. In one way that frankly, I, was, I wasn't even thinking about. There are some electrical components out there. They're just sitting out there on the outside of a house and building that are not really safe. And so Tommy's gonna to share some pictures and some of the things that we uh, should know that he knows. And uh, maybe we can do our jobs a little bit better. So Tommy, thank you for being here. Thank you, Ben, for inviting me. How, ma how, many, how many years have you been an electrician? 44 years in the industry. I've Jeez, got that's... a master in, master wow. in DC, Maryland and Virginia. I was in the union for 19 years where I taught 13 years theory uh, code and safety and uh, was in business for myself for 15 years where I did mostly um, uh, residential work. That's amazing. That's amazing. That's almost as long as I've been alive. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Tommy, we, um, I don't know how we hooked up. We hooked up online or something and I invited you to just come by. You're not a professional college teacher or anything like that. You're just, you're out there in the field, you're an electrician and you see a hazard and you want to talk to us about potential hazards of nice uh, knife blade disconnect switches, which are commonly used for places like solar panels, swimming pools, jacuzzis, heat pumps, furnaces, and water heaters. And you're saying that there's an inherent uh, danger, a hazard to them that maybe home inspectors should be paying attention to. Is that right? Exactly, exactly. I'm hoping that home inspectors will take a look at these boxes through the eyes of a child. That's awesome. So uh, before you start talking about your first picture there that I see, I want to remind all the attendees that if you have a question for Tommy or me, uh, there's two ways to do it. On the bottom of your uh, like webinar kind of Zoom uh, panel there, there's a thing called Q&A or a chat. So if you want to say hey to Tommy, or ask him a question, uh, I'll be paying attention to the questions um, as he talks and shares what he knows about um, knife blade disconnect switches. So Tommy, why don't you go ahead and, and tell us what you wanna talk about in relation to the uh, pictures you wanna share. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, the um, knife blade disconnect switches have been around for a century. No one has ever revised the standard. Everyone looked at them as being safe. But I ended up seeing a potential lethal hazard here. Well, it start, started while doing roughly 300 solar inspections before I re ever realized this potential issue. Right here, you have the conduit coming down from the roof from the solar panels. That's the DC voltage. I have a nervous tremor, so just bear with me. You got uh, this is the inverter that switches the DC to AC. Then we have this conduit that comes all the way over, turns into a knife blade disconnect switch. Most utility companies require an external disconnect switch either to kill the DC voltage or one to kill the AC voltage. They don't want the solar grid feeding back into their utility um, service while they are working on the service. So here we have this disconnect, then it goes down this conduit, pokes into the panel where we'll, I'll discuss that in a minute. Here we have that switch wide open. These line side terminals are fully energized. Hmm. Fully energized. And I will let you know why that or why that is. 
these load side terminals are fully energized. Hmm. Fully energized with the switch open. No one ever saw this double whammy. If a child pulls down on this handle, flips that little flip latch, you've got 240 volts on the top, 240 volts on the bottom. Why do I say that? Going back to last picture. This is the load side of that disconnect switch. That's the 110 coming off of the inverter, or not 110, the 240 coming off of that inverter is tied to the load side of that disconnect switch. Inside, we have another issue. Well, first off, many of these disconnects, this is another one outside, and I'm gonna discuss this one as being the most hazardous. Many of them have warning labels attached to them. They have labels that say property of this solar company. Here we have one on the inside. Now, that line side of that disconnect switch outside ties into the load side here. The line side ties into the service utility wires before the main breaker. Again, you have both sides of that disconnect switch fully energized. Huh. Here we have another one. In order to tie, and you ladies and gentlemen need to be aware of this, in order to tie into a service, it can be accomplished two ways. A two pole circuit breaker must be mounted at the opposite end from the main breaker. Now, don't say that's at the bottom because you can mount the main breaker at the bottom and the breakers above. There's nothing that says you can't. It has to be at the opposite end from the main breaker. Hmm. If there's no space in that panel for a two pole breaker or the PV system is larger than the ampacity of the panel, these solar companies, electricians, are feeder tapping the line side wires before the main breaker. Up here at the top of this panel, they're feeder tapping. That power is energized the day that feeder tap is, or that disconnect is fully energized the day that that feeder tap is tapped. Right. You are required by code to have an overcurrent protection device within 10 feet of that tap. If there is no room to the left or right of the panel, the solar companies are mounting the disconnect switch below the electrical panel at toddler height. Hmm. Toddler height. Now that it, line side is fully energized. That switch, the day it's installed, that switch might sit like that for a week, two weeks, or two months. I've seen this with my own eyes. Some companies are slow in calling for an inspection. Hmm. Now you've got the switch in the off position, and all a child has to do is flip that little flip latch, and they're into some dangerous shit. Yep. So. That that covers that. So, but Tommy, now on the, let's let's on go the, back out here. Hey, Tommy, yeah, go ahead. On the outside, yeah. Uh, one more picture to the left on the outside. Isn't there normally right there something like a piece of plastic, like a no. plastic shield or something? Guard shield, 
Yeah. You, I'm going to cover that too. Oh, okay. Guard shields are not required by the UL standards. <laughs> the interlock is not required by the UL standard. Yeah. Now we come over to- I usually see them missing anyways. No, but, oh. So anyway, the guard shields are only on 100 amp and larger disconnects. Any 60 or 30 amp disconnect, huh. you will never find a guard shield huh. over those slide, side terminals. Hmm. And the smaller the switch, the easier it is to pull down on the handle. So even if the switch is open, you're saying that, that's obviously there's a hazard. Yeah, line and load are both energized because this is coming off of the um, utility wires before the main breaker that is powering that side of the disconnect. Yeah. This side is being powered off of the inverter. And so that's both sides are energized. And if you touch that, that's not a, that's not a finger wiggle. That's no. not fatal. And you know damn well that the child is going to have one hand on that box. That's grounded. Yeah. The, and children are um, enticed sure. by nice shiny objects. We got it, the perfect remedy for a lethal hazard. Yep. Now we have this switch. I'm not trying to call anybody out. Sure. At all. But these people have known about it for three years. And I hope that they would have led the industry. But they didn't. This switch here, give me a second, because I actually have that switch. Let me see if I can do this. That yep. switch is this switch here. Yep, we I see carried it. this switch through the halls of Annapolis. Look at the position of the handle in the on position. Look at the picture. No flip latch here. Nope. That's how easy it is for a child to get in this box. Yep. We teach children to go around peg and round hole. I guarantee you, a child can lift up a cover. Yep. Now, I ended up sending, I discovered the hazard in 2016, uh, right, right around uh, spring, late spring. And I got fired by a job because of this. While I was looking for a job, I sent my governor, Governor Larry Hogan, a document explaining the hazard. I also sent it to mainstream media. Governor Hogan's office recognized that there might be an issue here. He's, their office sent it down to every state agency. The state fire marshal had my document Every county and city municipality have my document. And every one of them told me to get a code change. Everything um, is approved by code. Now, before I went down this road, I contacted Mike Holt. I'm an intelligent man about the code. And I've researched it up and down, couldn't find anything. And Mike Holt's words were, everything they're doing is by code. I understand your passion. And if you want to get something done, get a law done. Well, I'll follow up with this in a minute. But this was the uh, Maryland Senate president has been in office for 30 years in that seat. They already have a, a building wing named after him and he's still alive. And this is Governor Hogan that many of you have seen on the media lately. Anyway, in two, 
I sent it to them and everybody said, get a code change. I submitted a code change to the 2020 code, but the, web, the NEC's website's kind of hard to negotiate. So I ended up um, sending a, um, Uh, a document out to um, everybody on the code writing committees, panels, and um, to even the solar industry. And the solar industry, I talked to a, a, uh, a um, consultant who happens to be on code writing panel four of the NEC that deals with solar. A codes and standards guy and the CEO got my document with supporting pictures. I thought I submitted the code change to the 2020 code, but apparently I didn't do it correctly. But the solar industry took notice of it. And if you see this line right here that says this PI was developed by the PV industry forum. PI stands for public input. That is what's called submitting a code change. Yep. Up here, they state that these boxes are, I'm trying to figure, see where it's at. Um, these boxes are somewhere along the line. These boxes are easily accessible. Um, it's, it's right there. Easily, easily open, open, exposing potentially life-threatening currents and voltages. Sure. They submitted the code change. They recognized it. Once the code change was adopted, it now requires an article um, 690.13 and 690.15 that any of these boxes installed for solar must be locked or require a tool to open them. That could be a screw in a nut or a zip tie. So I was grateful that the solar industry got it in and it was accepted. In 2018, I decided I'm trying to pull this up. There it is. This in 2018, I got a bill sponsored 1486. It made its way through the House of Delegates in Annapolis unanimously, but died in the Senate. Knowing that I needed the Senate support. I ended up contacting and had a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the Maryland Senate president that I just showed you his picture. He, he supported me. I got this bill sponsored in 2019 by a different delegate. It made it through way through the house. Every Republican and every Democrat voted for my bill, this bill. It made it through the Senate, long story, but it made its way through the Senate with an amendment that basically stripped out the pre-existing switch boxes and only requires requiring the company that leases installed solar full day systems to install a certain lockout tag containing a safety warning. That's all new installation as of July 1 of 2020, uh, 2019. It's all the way down at the bottom. I ain't going to scroll through. Don't worry about that. Yeah. Um, three months now, back to my picture again. Hold on. That bill was signed on April 30th, 2019. That room was filled with mainstream media outlet. Not a single one 
approached me about this bill. Three months after my bill went into law, knowing that the media never exposed it, electricians and solar companies weren't aware of it, and the inspectors weren't aware of it. Three months after that bill went into law, I called every county inspection, municipality and city municipality, and not only one, Baltimore City, were the only ones that knew about the law. Hopefully they're now enforcing it. This year in March, I spoke in front of the PG County Council and the Frederick County Council about the pre-existing. Frederick County, I am grateful to say, is going to research their records and any home that got a solar permit will receive padlock seals. Nice. When I wrote that bill, I used lockout tags. That's what's commonly used in locking these boxes out. That's what OSHA proves. But OSHA doesn't deal with inside of a home. Right. So padlock seals are similar to what the utility companies use. They are made in UV plastic that can be printed a warning on it. And then the metal clasp that goes through the locking mechanism and they literally cost a penny or less a piece. <laughs> the cost to the county will be $6,000 estimated huh. because they are that cheap. Yeah. Okay. So cool. when I got my bill passed, this bill I want to clear up, no, wrong, wrong slide. When I got this bill passed, it says lockout tags. I ended up discovering lockout tags did not really, they're not cheap and they don't conform to using outdoors. And before I got fired, I ended up encouraging my colleague and I to use a zip tie, a UV protected zip tie. And I figured, well, maybe I could get one printed on. <laughs> and I got a thousand of these done. I then burnt a scorch mark on the backside about a half an inch from the end so that when you tighten them up, right. they're like that. That way you, you cannot get in it. And they were printed with danger, do not remove. I had, I did not intend to profit off of saving a child's life, but if I can offer something cheaper than what's out on the market why not and there are some and, tags there are plastic tags out there that are not ul they're not yeah. uv protected right they'll yeah. just fall off yeah yeah so i started a company called tommy tag but before i ever got it off the ground i discovered padlock seals hmm. and i couldn't compete with something that cost a penny or less a piece. But people think that I tried to profiteer hmm. off of all of this. <laughs> and I wanted to just, you know, shoot that down. Sure. Now, the last part, and I'm almost done. This is UL, hold on. This is UL 98. This is the safety standard. 6.2.5A. Single 
or Dafat. A single door may be provided regardless of the width of the door. Next one. A door or cover intended to give access to fuses shall be hinged, sliding, or similarly attached as to prevent its removal. Switches marked as suitable for use in service equipment shall, I'm having a hard time reading it, provide, shall, uh, shall be provided with a means of sealing. Right. That's the locking provision. And the last one, the enclosure shall be constructed so as all, all doors can be opened to a minimal of 90 degrees from the closed position. Right. That is the safety standard for night blade switches. The interlock is not required by this by this um, standard. Right. The guard shields are not required by this standard. Those are things that the companies that manufacture them do. Now, when I called Mike Holt back after getting my bill passed unanimously, he congratulated me and said, you have made the world a little safer. safer. Yeah. Little did I know how true those words were. This switch here, if you open the cover, for, oh, first off, this switch here, their parent company is Schneider Electric. Schneider Electric's corporate office is in France. In France, not here in the United States and not in Germany with the name Schneider. But if you open this cover, you will see a label, actually the side of the box. You will see a label made in Mexico. Yep. This is a worldwide potentially lethal hazard that no one ever realized. Hmm. No one, no one. And Pete, the other thing, I have done this without the support of any company, agency or organization or the most important not the first hazardous statistic. But if a child can do that, yep. get in one, I've been able to convince a lot of people. That's um, awesome. In, last thing as I finish up, Mike Holt, has been conducting a live stream that, um, let me close this out. I hope, I'm trying to get back to, trying, you hear me? Yeah, you're trying okay. to get back to what? I'm trying to get back to the full screen, but I can't seem to do it. But if you all can see me, that, yeah. that's okay. This, Mike Holt on, on April 21st, devoted his first 20 minutes talking about everything I've accomplished. That's He's true. the late nation's leading electrical code expert. He's known within 15 different countries as the expert. He devoted the first 15, 20 minutes talking about me. And at the very end, he said, Tommy, you've been a pain in the ass. What? <laughs> what? And, and he's true. We actually started the live stream saying, this guy's a pain in the ass. He's still a pain in the ass. He said, he called me every name in the book. He called 
the IBW, the any, uh, uh, you name it. I call people. I was passionate about this, and yep. people just were not listening. But Mike ended up saying at the very end, he said, "Tommy, you never gave up." He yep. said, "You're my hero. <laughs> You're my hero. That meant special." Well, He's Tommy, in M magazine, electrical trade magazine. Yep. devoted five pages or six pages talking about this hazard. Yep. And now I am grateful to Internashi for being able to share this with the members and get it out there and get it in to code requirements for home inspections. Right. Lastly, Last year, or 2019, yes, last year, someone submitted my name to AARP. Out of 40 nominees, they selected me to receive this beautiful award called the Andrus Award, named after the woman that started AARP, and it was given to me for outstanding public service. I am proud of what I've been able to accomplish. And now to be able to tell as many people out there, please look at these things through the eyes of a child. Now, it, it, the if this my code public inputs are, are approved, that'll be 2023. Then we're looking in another year to two or more before the municipalities started adopting that code. We're looking at five years before other knife blade switches are secured. So in the meantime, home inspectors, my God, you, you stretch across the US and Canada and beyond, um, you can stop a child from getting hurt by carrying a pack of UV zip ties in your back pocket. If you see one of these for any use, put a zip tie through the locking mechanism. The last, last thing is they wrap up. These ones used for solar, ladies and gentlemen, only need to be accessed by a solar technician. And that is only if there's an issue with the solar system, right? which is about as rare as having an issue with your meter cabinet. And that meter cabinet has a tag on it. These boxes for solar need to have a tag on it that Nobody, not any electrician, no home inspector, no one needs to access these boxes after they have been properly installed and inspected. Agreed. Agreed. Tommy, what, what, you got a website for those Tommy ties? I'd buy a hundred. <laughs> I, I shut it down, Ben, because as I said, they yeah. were. I think I could get them as low as 10 cents a piece or maybe yeah. eight cents. But when, you know, there's there's three or four companies out there that sure. make those padlock seals. You know, I had no idea they were called padlock seals until I had already invested, you know. And I went through over a hundred of them because for me to do what I wanted to do, um, I couldn't get the scorch mark on the back of the zip tie manufactured yeah. At, yeah. at that time. They would yeah. manufacture UV protected zip ties, but not with the burn mark. I sat down with my soldering iron and scorched a mark on over 100 or over 500 of those Tommy ties. So they were ready to go out, but you know. Well, Tommy, you know, I've been slammed for being an entrepreneur. Yep. I watch yep. Shark Tank. I love those people. <laughs> you know, so 
I own my own business. Many people can't say that either. But, um, you know, I stepped outside the box and, you know, and I'm grateful that I was, if I had been doing just electrical inspections and not day in and day out doing solar inspections, I may never have caught this. Yep. It yep. happened by chance. I, I was inspecting someone's solar system and they had one of those boxes mounted below the panel right. in a finished basement. Hmm. The gentleman was holding his one or two year old child in his arms and his other three kids are playing with one of those boxing things, the long ones, you know, in the family room. And I ended up saying, everything passes inspection. The next phase of this will be the utility company will be notified and they will come out to swap out the meter. You don't need to be home for that process. Right. And then it hit me. Oh my God. I don't know what happened there. Did I you took away your screen. Oh, okay. Yeah. And I said, I lost train of, train of thought. Um, you you were the, you found that first, you found that first uh oh, and so said, then so so I said you don't have to be home now. I had been on the job for maybe a month, and my colleague who had no master's license, no certification to do any inspection, he told me that the outside switch boxes were secured by the utility company when they came out to swap out the meter. <laughs> well, that's not the case. I don't know if it's the electrician or the utility company that requires it. But that first picture that I showed you was from a different county. That box was four inches or less from the meter box. And that box was not secure. But I was under the impression the outside boxes were secure. They, the, the utility companies recognized that there's a problem here. And then it dawned on me, oh my God. Who's taking care of the inside ones? They can be in garages. They can be in any room. You can put a main service electrical panel in any room but a bathroom. You can even have it in the kitchen if it's far enough away from the water source. But who's securing them? You can have one in your child's bedroom and you send your child for a 10 minute time out and they start playing with one of these and they're dead. Yep. They're dead. And no one will ever know that they turn the switch off because it's supplemental power. It's still tied to the utility grid. You will never see those lights blink. Well, Tommy, yep. uh, I really appreciate your time, man. I really appreciate taking the time to tell us something so that we can be better inspectors and help people stay safe and especially the kids. Um, and uh, I can see, I think everybody can see that you're passionate about what you're doing and uh, I wish you all the best, but let, let's, let's do this again. Maybe you can talk about other electrical defects that us home inspectors should be aware of. How's that sound? It sounds wonderful, Ben. All right, Thanks. Tommy. I really appreciate it, man. Thank you so much. I, and I appreciate you, Ben. You got it. And, and all of Internachi for allowing me to speak today. You got it, buddy. I'll see you soon. And I'll see everybody real soon on the next webinar. And everybody stay safe and healthy. And we'll catch you next time. Thanks, Tommy. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Well, Ben. <laughs>